All right, everybody. High Seas Rally. How are we doing out here today? That's so good. Welcome to the Grease and Gears Garage, a little segment that we're going to be doing here. I'm Chris with Cycle Source Magazine. I'm going to be your host up here throughout the week. I appreciate you coming and hanging out with us. I know everybody had a long day. First day at port. Myself, I was pr proposed to twice and had more indecent proposals than the time. The t <laughs> more indecent proposals than the time I ended up at Disneyland on Pride Week. Five minutes off the ship, I'm like, are you kidding? This is a tough town, man. Like, it wasn't my hair. Shut up. <laughs> See how we treat our guests up here. So what is Grease and Gears Garage? About eight years ago, I think, Cycle Source Magazine went on the mission to bring the garage back out to the motorcycle events. And we would always ask some of our builder friends like Tom here to come out and teach people stuff. So while you guys are partying, hanging out, there's a chance that you'll learn something or be inspired to go and create your own thing. That's the same thing we're gonna do here in a little limited capacity. When we were first negotiating this with the people from High Seas and we explained, well, we could bring a welder up and some torches and a bandsaw. They were, the, the only word I can use is horrifying grimace. So apparently we can't have stuff like that on a big boat Fire and boat we've come up with some alternatives, but they're awesome. I want you guys to put your hands together for me real quick and welcome a friend to the stage, Mr. Tom Kiefer from Franklin Church Choppers. <laughs> oh, it's going to be a rough oh, we, crowd. Is my mic on? Your, I think your mic okay. is on. Thank you, Pat, for being in the front row. You're going to support me big. Pat from Lead Sled. <laughs> So Tom uh, has a company back in Pennsylvania, Central Pennsylvania, Franklin Church Choppers. And Tom and I met many, many years ago over custom motorcycles. And uh, it was funny to me because in spite of my long hair and his short hair, his reserved costume and my ostentatious nature, we got to be really good friends over motorcycles. The first time I ever spent in a garage with him Watching him get down in the garage, this man is a machine when it comes to service, repair, identifying problems. So today I asked him to come out and look at what is probably the most recognized and definitely widely used carburetor in the aftermarket, the SNS Super Carburetor. So Tom's going to take us through this. We're going to take a look at the identifiable parts, the most probable things to go wrong, and what you have to do in repair. Give it up for Tom. All right. So... Just to uh, back that up a little bit, I've known Chris for a long, long time. Started at the smoke out in the back parking lot years and years and years ago, at least 20 years ago. Not that parking lot. Yeah, not that parking lot. <laughs> Pretty well, but anyway, I've been in business for, uh, since 1999. I started very small, started my little house garage. I was an auto mechanic growing up all the way through elementary school, junior high school, high school. So I'm pretty much a service repair kind of guy. I, I built a bunch of bikes. I really build the bikes just to bring them in, bring people in at shows. I can't, put, I can't bring in a Harley Street Glide with a new tire and say, look what I did. You know? He builds bikes because he has the same addiction that we do. Yeah. All the way up to, he has an incredible pair of motorcycles that he actually races at Sons of Speed. He wrenches on everybody's bikes at Sons of Speed. He's downplaying it himself, but I'll talk about him. He builds a badass motorcycle. You can see one of them here on the ship. He built the blue knucklehead. Nice. With the carbon fiber wheels. Hey! And the, 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 listen, I can't, I can't speak, I can't speak to the flip flops. I can't. All right, so, so uh, we're gonna start up here a little bit. We're gonna try and get into something, and I'm sure it's just gonna get worse from here. <laughs> so anyway, I'm, I'm doing a super e carburetor today. SNS's uh, carburetor. Basically, this is the not predecessor, but the the one after the B or the D that actually has an accelerator pump, and that are used quite often on numerous or many, many, many of your, what I'm saying, aftermarket bikes, choppers, sporties, stuff like that, that's, that's not fuel injected. Okay, so this is what we're using, basically. Been using them for years. A lot of people like CVs. A lot of people like the um, uh, Makunis. It's just, this to me is an easier carburetor. It's basically a soup can with a with some fuel coming through it. That, that's the first thing is, you know, every, everything in motorcycling, especially when you talk about performance, comes down to you building something in the place that you're going to ride it. You can have the fastest bike in the world, but if it's, not, if it's not built to go how you like to go from, if you're a stop sign to stop sign guy, that's how you want to build a bike. If you're out in the highway hauling ass, that's how you want to build it. So selecting something like this, I can imagine also, 
is a very personal, this is what I sure. need to do. Sure, sure, sure. You got the early carburetors from the, um, like I say, the D. I have a D carburetor on my alcohol shovel head, 15 to 1 compression. It's got a milk hose for the fuel line. I mean, it's, it's crazy, but there's no accelerator pump. We didn't want an accelerator pump for that because it's a drag bike, and I'd roll on the throttle hard before I even pull away, but we're not whacking it down and downshifting and upshifting like we do on the street. Um, so long story short, we, the Super E, Super G, so the E's got an inch and seven eighths bore with a 39.6 Venturi in the middle. And uh, basically that's designated underneath the SNS Super right there on the, on the bottom, it says the E. So basically the E is made for pretty much any bike, your sporties, your big twins, under 100 cubic inch. Um, you can put them over, but generally under 100 cubic inch is where you want the E. If you put a G on something under, it'll still run, but you're going to have to really jet it down. The Venturi is going to be a little big. It's going to be a little lethargic. It's not going to run like you want, especially from experience. You put it on a guy's 80 cubic inch Evo, and he goes to start it, and the first time he goes to start it, he whacks the throttle like six times like he used to doing, and he lifts the enriching and he hits the button and, and it's flooded out. You know, he's got fuel almost running out of his exhaust. He's like, it won't start. Well, no sh Yeah, no shit. So, so from the audience. It's not a choke. Yeah, so from the audience here, we got something. So, which is good because um, SNS carburetors do not have a choke. They have what's called an enrichener circuit. The enrichener circuit comes in. If it had a regular SNS air cleaner, you'd actually reach down and just lift it with your finger, but it's not a choke like you think of on the old dirt bikes or anything like that. It's actually an enrichener where when you lift, when you lift the lever on the back of the carburetor, it actually lifts the enrichener and it actually draws air past the enrichener in at a different, through a different orifice of which to get more fuel into it. So, yeah, let's more guessing with uh, it's that. So, so in essence, the enrichener is actually here on the carburetor, and you can actually take it apart. When you change air cleaners, which a lot of us do with SNS, we don't use the actual SNS a teardrop air cleaner, so we change carburetors. So when you do that, you can't sit there and just hold this thing up with your hand most of the time. So they make some aftermarket, uh, different aftermarket uh, products that you can lift up and turn it, and you can actually lift. Some of them have three phases or three steps. Some have one step. Some have only you know, have two steps where you can start it. So you can actually just pull this out and put another, another uh, plunger in. I call it a plunger, it might not be the proper word, but, and again, this is me in my language. It might not be your language and everybody else's language, but this is me. I'm just a simple guy from Pennsylvania that builds bikes and tunes them, has some fun. It does uh, service and repair. So anyway, like I said, so when you change the air cleaner, you can change your, you can change your enrichener so that it actually can be used without the air cleaner that has the friction-based um, lift lever. And again, it's not a choke, it's an enrichener. So moving on from there, moving on from there, um, I'm gonna actually start to disassemble the carburetor a little bit. Um, there's a couple different things. So on the top of the carburetor here, where the throttle plates are, you have several different different throttle um, cable looms, wrong word. Mounts. Mounts, there we go, thanks. So anyway, you have, you have several different mounts. You have the older mounts, you have the newer mounts. So like for the 1990 later CV carbs, like a lot, of the, a lot of the bikes will have CV carburetors on them from Harley from whether it's a Sportster, Big Twin, whatever. So you don't have to change your cables. You can actually put this particular high lift mount on the factory carburetor, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the SNS carburetor, and you can use your cables without switching your cables. Or you could use the shorter mount if you had earlier ones and you wanted to use, I would recommend you use the push-pull cable system, two cables, not one. And I would recommend that on any chopper. There's a lot of chopper guys that'll say, well, it doesn't look as cool. Like this guy over here. But anyway, I prefer to do two cables. Which usually results in a phone call where I ask Tom, hey man, what's wrong with my throttle? Yeah, or, or it results in, damn it, I didn't get stopped when I opened my throttle and I went to shift and it took off and I couldn't reach down four feet to my bottom and turn the key off because I didn't have a kill switch either. I never said that. Well, you didn't, but other people have. Met plenty of people have actually put a single cable, had their cable routed the wrong way, and this thing stuck wide open and not only did they have a single cable that they couldn't yank it back, didn't yank it back, they also didn't have a kill switch. 
So that's one thing that I pretty much incorporate in all my, all my bikes, whether it's a toggle switch, a hold, a friction switch, something. I incorporate it. That's just, that's just me, though. That's just me. Maybe I'm a little bit more careful than some people. Well, I don't think nope. it's so much. Yeah, listen, before the chopper guys in the front row come up here and attack you over this table, <laughs> I think it might actually have to do more with your constant exposure to the, the um, Pennsylvania state laws as they come to inspection. Yeah. So, you know, well, I'm an inspection they're, mechanic. They're safety and, by nature. I'm an inspection mechanic in Pennsylvania. However, that's not part of the inspection. It doesn't have to have a return cable. However, for me, personally, if I build a bike, I always put a, a two cables on it. I just, I prefer to put two cables on it. Uh, a lot of times it's hard to find a good throttle that has a uh, push return, but there are times, many times actually, where I've, well, well, there's many that I didn't. So, so we're gonna pop this carburetor apart and uh, pop the bowl off the bottom. And I'm gonna show you a couple things with the bottom, with the, uh, the bowl itself. So we're gonna pull this off. So there's a couple things here on the bottom of the bowl that you'll notice. You got three short screws, which are real easy. Um, if you have the SNS teardrop air cleaner, you actually have to pull the air cleaner off to be able to get to two of these screws. If you have the aftermarket with a flat plate, a lot of times you can actually, you can get them all. Now I have a quick thing to say about that. I have learned now over my years of running this carburetor, I just don't even screw around anymore. When I have carburetor work to do that's gonna require me to take the bowl off, I just take the two bolts from the intake and get that, it off the bike and that's for sure table. that's for sure but in <laughs> i do a lot of this in my shop too and a lot of times i pull the bowl i'll pull the two inter the intermediate and the main jet out and the main jet um tube and i don't even pull the rest of the carburetor off and i can get it clean enough by doing just that so i can get clean enough so the carburetor when it's actually mounted and the air cleaners on it actually comes back it comes back over, so you can't get to these two bolts without pulling that backing plate. If it has a flat plate, you can get right to it, pop it off. If you have a velocity stack, it's so much easier. It's easier. So anyway, we're going to yank this bowl off of here. And when we pull the bowl off, there's a couple things to look at. On the top of the, uh, the, uh, the tube for the thing. Yeah, the thing for the accelerator pump, this is the accelerator pump on the top. It actually sprays. There's a little teeny tiny cut in it that you can actually get your fingernail or maybe a razor blade in, there's an O-ring on the top of here. And that O-ring is actually, when you take the gasket off, is actually st stuck right here on the top. So the O-ring's on the top, it's actually stuck in there, so I'm not even gonna take it out right now. But anyway, when you take it off, here's what you got. You got an intermediate down here, and you have the main jet here, and you have the main jet orifice that actually it comes through to the top here. No, I don't want to slow you down, but real quick, if you could just explain, because this is one of the things from the very onset of starting to look at this, because this is the most important part of tuning right here. This mm -hmm. is where tuning starts, but can you explain to people how those two circuits interact with the motorcycle, like intermediate jet, main jet? Okay, so, so I'm going to put my old man glasses Three on. Three circuits. I'm going to put my, my, uh, my old man glasses on, and when we start off, once you get this motorcycle warmed up enough that it's actually hot running temperature and you're off of the enrichener circuit and that's now running with the enrichener all the way down, it's running through the actual carburetor, it's running on 99% of the time, it's running on the intermediate jet. The inter intermediate jet has numbers on the end, sometimes there's numbers on the side. Uh, this one's actually odd, I've, I haven't seen one of these, I don't know if ever, that does not have a straight screwdriver where you can actually get it off. The numbers are on the end, but yet there's no flat on it, there's no straight, so it's, it's, I'm thinking it's an aftermarket jet that fits an s and I've not, I've not seen that before. Generally there's a straight, just like this one, has a straight screw on the end, so you can actually fit a straight screwdriver in. This one usually is like that. So long story short, you pull this out, and there's actually a number on the end. This is a number 28, and then the main jet on this is a number 74 as said here. So to me, that's actually a fairly common jet size, which if you go to the book, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recommend one thing, if you ever get one of these carburetors, they come with a book, don't throw the book away. Because the book, <laughs> good Lord, the book is awesome. On, um, on so let, me, let me just stop at this point, and I'm going to preface a couple things that I've learned up here. Three positions of the enrichener. Seriously? <laughs> don't throw the book away. So, so on page 25 of the book, on the back, it'll actually give you a displacement for um, stockers. Now, these are for ENG settings. They got stock motors, 88 cubic inch, 
96 cubic inch, 100 cubic inch, 107, 113. It actually tells you a base jetting to start with. And I don't even care what exhaust, two in the one, you know, open exhaust, you know, true duels, whatever. If you start with that base jetting, a lot of times it's pretty close. I mean, it's pretty close. So, so when you're running this bike and you're less than what I'm going to say, say you're running down the road 60 mile an hour, 55 mile an hour, you're running 2,500 RPM or something, you are on this intermediate jet 80% of the time, 80, 80, maybe even 85%. When you get past that about three eighths, almost approaching the half throttle and you really start to roll into it, that's when it actually starts to suck. The air rushes past, this butterfly opens up. When that butterfly opens up, the air rushes in. Actually, it's this way. The air rushes in and it, and it runs. Yeah, when, yeah, it rushes in and it rushes over the orifice tube and it actually just, it sucks the fuel up. It, it pulls it with it via the air rushing over top of this tube, this tube right here. So most of the time when you're running, you're on the intermediate. So if you're running around and say you're running around, you know, your side street, you got it warmed up, you're just kind of cruising around and it keeps on going, kah, kah, and you feel it on the inside of your leg or you hear it coming out. It's got COVID and it's also lean. It's also lean, something that I'm not today, but because I've been on a cruise for a couple of days now, I'm starting to get a little bit thicker. Anyway, it's, if it's coughing out the air cleaner, it's lean. It's generally, it, it, there, is a, there is some times that you can actually cough out the air cleaner when you're overly rich, but generally that's a lean condition. So the first thing I do is I would actually pull the bowl and I would jump up. If it's a 2.8, I'd go a 2.95. And just jump up a 2.95 and do the same exact road test you just did and try and duplicate the same exact riding condition and the same exact throttle position and see if you can get it to do it. If you ride that same ride and it doesn't do it, you're pretty good. If it does it once instead of five times in a mile, maybe jump up to a 30 or 31. Okay, so real quick again, before we even get to the changing of the jets, there is, and this may be different for every guy you talk to, but there are a standard set of this many out, this, you know, okay. all the way in, this many out. You're right. I, I, I failed to mention before I even started talking about jetting, on the very top of the carburetor, you got an idle air mixture, which is this one right here. This is not the idle. It is not the idle. The idle is actually the little straight screwdriver on the back of the butterfly, the back of the actual lever that, that your cable's attached to. Why s and and I'm not going to question one of the most awesome racers in the history of the not United on States. Not Yeah, <laughs> but I put this carburetor on and probably eight of ten times I'll have them come back in a month or two months. My bike runs like shit and I just can't figure this out. And I say, well, I can see it puffing black out the back. It's crazy. He goes, yeah, I turn the idle up and it doesn't seem to do any difference. I said, it does do difference. It's making your bike run like shit. So generally, the general rule of thumb with this, with the idle air mixture is you lightly seat it. You lightly seat it and you turn it out a turn and a half. And you start at a turn and a half. If you got to go more than two turns, generally that means you got to go a bigger intermediate. If you're less than a turn and a half, so once it's all warmed up, you start the bike up, you're gonna warm it up, and you're gonna slowly, you can take it for a ride, get it to full operating temperature. Don't do this in like your lift in two minutes. Get it to operating temperature. You're gonna actually turn this in slowly. From a, you're gonna start at a turn and a half. Turn in slow, and you're gonna hear the RPM either go up or it's gonna go down. Generally, it's gonna, well, I can't say generally. It could be either way. If it goes up, keep on turning it in, and you might even have to lower the actual idle on the butterfly because it might actually idle over 2,000, 2,200 RPM. You lower the RPM, you keep on turning slowly. I mean, I'm talking like really slow. And as you turn in slow, you'll hear it. And all of a sudden you'll hear it start to falter. The idle will start to go down and you'll start to hear it falter. When it falters, now you go back the opposite way slow and you get it to where it comes back. The idle starts to come back up and then you'll hear it falter the other way. And you're going to find your best equal spot between the two. If you're over two turns out on your enrichener, if you're over two turns, put a bigger jet in it. If you're under a turn and a half, put a smaller jet in it and see where you can go. Go from there. Basically, that's, that's kind of the rule of thumb I've done. I've been fooled a couple times. I mean, it's, I've, I've, I've gone jets back and forth 10 times on the same bike and finally I was like, what's going on? And I found a couple of silly things that, that I missed. But j that's a pretty good rule of thumb. If you're over... Well, and that, that it's really important information too because when you're first starting with this stuff, 
this can be the most intimidating thing, and you especially going and asking people. You know what I mean? So having that standard, I mean, it's 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 a piece of equipment. It's a piece. It's a piece of that machine. So having that standard operation to get to where you need to be. So it, it'll identify the changes that you need itself. It's the, not like you need to. The to biggest thing I'm going to say before you start changing jets or before you start riding, before you do anything, make sure your air cleaner's on, make sure you don't have any intake leaks, meaning the intake that goes in, here's an intake from a shovel. It actually has the, uh, uh, the flanges for the shovel. And there's a, there's a gasket that goes between here. And actually it's a, it's a wooden, uh, separator, I can't even think of the proper term, but it's, it's got an O-ring on both sides, and they mate, and basically it's an insulator block. That's what it's Proper called. term. <laughs> it's an insulator, insulator block. So basically you want to make sure that's in there, and you start it up, you get it nice and warm, take it for a ride. If it's not running for crap, you come back, you know, do yourself a favor, get yourself some, this is brake clean, it's, it's uh, CarQuest, comes from Vance Auto. You can, use, you can use a lot of stuff. If it's flammable, you can use it, but use it sparingly. You spray it, and if the idle comes way up, you got, you got a vacuum leak somewhere. If it's pulling air from anywhere except through the face of the carburetor, you got a problem. You need, you need it to pull air through the front, not behind it, and not through the intake flanges. And so many people have pulled a carburetor, cleaned a carburetor, put it back on, they can't seem to get it running right, and I've, I've gone in and said, what'd you do so far? They come in and they bring it to me and I take the air cleaner off. The first thing I do is I grab the carburetor and I can do this. Dunk, 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 dunk. And the whole intake, is the, the rubbers are so dry that it's not sealing between the intake and the heads. So if it's not sealing between the intake and the heads, you're just defeating yourself the whole time. So we have about eight minutes. We're, we're trying to figure this out. So thank you guys for being patient with us. We have a question from the audience real quick. Uh-oh, it's Pat. So... I agree with everything being said right now. Just saying. So you come into a barn, you found an iron head. Okay. The carburetor's bounce around, cool, no big deal. Let's get to the accelerator pump. Because if this thing's not starting, you gotta figure out how to get that accelerator pump shooting a little gas to begin with and the idle jet. Because that's probably plug two. All right, well let's go. Phase one. So since Pat said that, that was going to be one of the things I went on. And somehow I got on a little side tangent, which is kind of funny, but it's good. So anyway, now that I took the bowl off of it, we're going to go to the most and the biggest nemesis of this entire motorcycle. The first thing is, is generally the, the intermediate jet is clogged. It's so small, you can barely put a needle through it. I have, I have jet drills, whatever. When you get this clean, that's all good. When you get the bowl off of it and put my old man glasses on, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to pull the bottom. You already have one screw up because that screw is the long screw that comes through. You're going to pull the other two screws off, and I'm going to try and do this so the screen can see it, move my hands. I always hold down on this because there's actually a spring underneath of the diaphragm for the, for the uh, accelerator pump. So this is the accelerator pump housing. It's got three screws on it, two small or two short, one long. The one long goes all the way in and holds the bolt. So you're going to pull this off, and when you do, it's going to pop off. And this one is exactly like what the barn fine iron head that Pat just talked about. It is absolutely 100% nasty underneath. Just to let you know, I bought this carburetor on eBay for $35. That's the biggest problem So, here. So see the rust underneath there and the underneath of this. Now this here is actually rubber. So you can see that I can push in on it. It's actually supposed to look like this. It's supposed to look like that right there, that piece. There's a spring that's underneath. There's two O-rings. There's two O-rings, two ball bearings. And the ball bearings, basically, it doesn't matter what I do. Look at that. Nice stuff came out of there. So that's a, that's a perfect example of what you're going to get. So I take these, throw them in my little tray over here. I'm going to take the uh, O-ring out. I'm going to throw it in the tray. I'm going to take the accelerator pump. I want to say something about the accelerator pump. I don't care what this thing looks like. If it's been sitting and it doesn't look like it's torn, you might go, you know what? I think I'm just gonna go ahead and clean it for a minute and put it right back in. Don't do it, throw it in that can. Get yourself one of these. Unless you're trying to get to the bar of that night. Yeah, unless you're trying to get to the bar of that night, then, then you're gonna make it there, it's gonna spit and pop and carry on, but you might make it. I've actually seen Pat Patterson ride to the bar with a can of starting fluid. Well, 
So there's a, little, there's a little spring that's underneath of it on the outside of the housing. But you got this little accelerator pump uh, kit, comes right from s and actually has the, the, uh, the rod, which this rod is really beautiful if you see it. That one's bad. That's the same rod that came out of this carburetor. This $35 carburetor from eBay. So, so now you see it. I mean, if anybody knows rods, Pat does. <laughs> So, if Mark so, Persichetti's at home watching this, we're changing the name of our shop. <laughs> so, here's what you get in this, this, uh, this kit. I get them out of drag specialties, but basically you're going to get a diaphragm, a spring, actually an accelerator pump, a spring, two O-rings, and you can't see it. There's one of the balls. Uh, you know, they're very small, Pat. And then there's another really one here and a couple O-rings. Easy for you, Pat. <laughs> so, so here's, here's the kicker. I'm going to try and clean this out real quick, real quick. I don't know if I can do it here. I'll, let me let me put some of this on here so it doesn't, so that the high seas rally doesn't get crazy or the cruise line doesn't go nuts. It's, now, this is actually imitate. Only water in here, actually. This is not. Now, if I was home, flammable. if I was home, this would come completely apart. I would put it in my sonic cleaner, which is pretty small, but it's big enough to actually put a bowl in. And I would actually sonic clean. I do it with just hot soapy Dawn dishwashing liquid. I don't do it with anything else because. If you use the, uh, the cleaner that comes with it, it's caustic, and it will That's literally... horrible. Yeah, it's bad. It's really bad. It's coming... It, usually, I would, act, I would clean this out in the sonic cleaner, and just like two minutes, three minutes would make this thing look, look like the outside of it. Hey, while Tom's working on uh, finishing up up here, if I could get the guys from the Sinners and Rick Bray to come up for our next segment, just kind of take the chairs behind them here, and we're going we're gonna to work towards how finishing how much, this up. I only got three minutes? Well, I mean, you I might be able to get this accelerator pump in in three minutes. All right, so we're going to do two things. So the spring goes in first. The spring goes in the little square hole in the bottom, the, the uh, actually triangular hole. Then you throw a little, the little ball on top of that, which I just dropped. Now it's in. I got to show this part because it's the hardest part of the whole damn process. O-ring goes in on top of that. Yeah, this next step makes me swear a lot. Well, I've, I found a way to get around it. Um, I just recently, after doing this for 20 years, so what I've finally done is the, uh, the spring goes on the outside. I've actually started taking the accelerator pump and setting it on, on here, setting the spring on top of the accelerator pump itself. Now, I don't have the ball in here. Ball goes in there. In here, there's another O-ring. goes in here, right there. What I've started doing is putting the accelerator pump on the, the bowl body, and taking the, the, the housing and going over top and pushing it straight down. Instead of trying to go the opposite way where you put that thing in top, and you gotta kinda work it around. But once you work it around for a minute, you'll feel it. It's actually down, it's down all the way, and now I can actually, yeah, work those balls. So you can actually, yeah, little balls, work those little balls. I'm using both, I use everything, I mean, whatever it takes. And then you go down. So what, what happens a lot of times, if you do it the opposite way and you try and do it with the, uh, with the spring underneath the plunger, you'll pinch the edge of this accelerator pump. I have another one right here. You'll pinch the edge of this pump right in here, and it won't work. And what, yes, I, what I do, the last thing that I do, and I don't think I put the second ball in because it dropped somewhere and I can't find it. What I do is I'll take my carb cleaner. I'll actually fill this bowl halfway up. And when I fill it halfway up, I take the plunger that came with the kit, and I'll stick it right into the actual accelerator pump hole, and I'll sit right like this, and I'll actually do this, and it will, and it will it's spray. Working. It was spraying dust, but. Yeah, yeah, but it'll spray, and if it sprays and does not leak around this housing, then you got it right. That is the number one problem with these carburetors before those two things. So. Right on, man. Well, listen, like I said, I'm sorry that we rushed you today. We're trying to figure out our timeline here, but uh, everybody give a big hand for Tom coming up and sharing some of this stuff about the SNS carburetor. Um, we've actually done this sim similar presentation on this before. You guys can go to Cycle Source Magazine YouTube and watch some of the old episodes of Grease and Gears Garage. But I appreciate you coming out and, and giving everybody a little knowledge on the high seas. I just got to let you know that I was forced to do a Jaeger bomb right before I came up here. <laughs> Patterson. It was like being in high school again. I was, it was like it was peer Pat. pressure out the ass. <laughs> well, speak. And what did he do? He caved. <laughs> he caved. Totally caved. 
<laughs> you were that guy in high school. I walked away, and then they, they like, drugged me back. <laughs> All right, so listen, we're going to switch everything over. This is only going to take one minute because we are trying to figure you, out this time. <laughs> if you want to grab a drink or anything real fast, we're just going to move this table out of the way and move right on into the second half hour of this program. But if you would, please, just one more time, thank Tom from Franklin Church Choppers. <laughs> 